Good morning again. We're going to be in Nehemiah 8, as Pastor Larry just encouraged us. So please turn there, whether it's in your Bible or maybe the church app or in your scriptural journals that we've been using. I would encourage you to continue on with these as we work our way through Nehemiah. Hopefully they're a blessing to you and keep you in God's word uh, in between times when we're regularly, regularly together. So Nehemiah 8, we're going to look at verses 13 through 18 this morning, and it's really paired together with what we were walking through last week. It's this walkthrough of God's encouragement through his word being declared. Once his word has been declared, the people begin to respond. And as the people respond, one of the things we see in the section today in verses 13 through 18 is a particular response as they remember something the Lord had previously, long ago, commanded them to be part of as his people. And this is something that we can keep walking through as we are the people of God in today's day and age, that God has called us to things throughout all of history, particular things. And as we recognize those things, they are reiterated to us through his word. But it's not enough just to hear God's word. And that's what we looked at last year. The people received God's word. They heard it. And some of the leaders and elders of the, of the people at that point went out into the crowd and made sure that they could explain it and that people were encouraged in it. But that's not the end of what happens. Following that, it's important for us to do what we've heard, to obey what God's called us to. So not only are God's call, people called to hear the word and sit under God's word, they're, they're called to obey God's word and follow it as they go forward. And that's what we see in the section today, this, this remarkable transition where the people have been declared the word to them and then they act on it. Things changed in their lives because the word of God had been declared. So let's read these verses, 13 through 18, and then we'll jump in as we talk about how to respond in obedience to the word that God's given us. Nehemiah 8, verse 13. On the second day, the heads of the fathers of houses of all the people, with the priests and the Levites, came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, and myrtle, and palm, and other leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof, and in their courts, and in the courts of the house of God, and in the square at the water gate, and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in the booths. For from the days of Yeshua, the son of Nun, to that day, the people of Israel had not done this. And there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. May God speak to us through his word this morning, particularly in how we respond to hearing God's word. You'll remember before Nehemiah got to Jerusalem, the people had largely kind of forgotten about what God was doing in their midst and what he had called them to. And Ezra had brought back and had come back with a remnant, but, but those people had not really caught the fire of following God. And Nehemiah was the one that God used to kind of catalyze that as they rebuilt the walls and the gates. And they showed that the glory of God was still very living and active in their day. And then we have this interaction, the work that God initially put them to, they obeyed and did. The walls and the gates are done. Ezra gets up, Nehemiah brings him in front of the people. He reads God's word and this, this change, this transformation happens with God's people. God's word doesn't just call us to do actions on, on his behalf while it does do that. It calls us to more of that. It calls us to go further. It calls us to actually listen to what he has said and what he has done and allow those truths to change our hearts. Because it's out of the belief of our hearts. It's out of the surrender of our hearts that we actually go and do things that honor the Lord. Not just out of a set of rules. There's a couple of very interesting points in this section. And one is 
In verse 17 that we're going to talk about, the very last sentence, it says there was very great rejoicing. Very great rejoicing in following God's commands. See, because when rules are given, when, when direction is given, when, when people are called to do particular things, there are a few ways we can respond. And there's also a few ways we can respond even in obedience. See, obligation and appreciation of what God has done. Obligation is because God has done good things for us. Appreciation for what God has done. Those are good motivating factors at times. But what's the greatest motivating factor? Joy. We talked last week about this joy that comes from understanding how good God has been to us. And that's where we get. That's where we pick up the people of God here. Ezra is reading God's word and all of a sudden people start to remember. Oh my word, God has provided for us for generations. He's been moving for hundreds of years. This isn't new because we built the walls. Let's remember how big God is and how gracious his provision is. And then that brings joy. See, celebration is the strongest motivating factor for following what God has called us to follow. If you've been walking with Jesus for very long, or you've been trying to follow your Bible and do what God has called you to do, there are also times in your spiritual life where sometimes you just need to buckle down and do what God's told you to do. Okay? That's called self-discipline. It's, it's listed in the fruits of the Spirit, self-control, that, that we don't just go do whatever we want all the time. We understand that what God has called us to and given us direction and is actually for our good that he's protecting us and encouraging us and helping us grow by obeying him. So there are times, there will be times in your spiritual life when you just got to buckle down and do it because God said do it. But that shouldn't be the daily behavior over and over and over again. Why? Because that doesn't reflect the joy of the Lord. It's not rightly recognizing that, yes, he has called us to do things and given us particular order in how to follow him, but he's done that because he is so gracious. To allow us to do our own thing would be unloving because we already know we'll just mess it up. It happened in Genesis 3, and it's been happening ever since. So in God's goodness to us, he gives us boundaries and guidelines and direction. So while sometimes spiritual discipline and following the Lord, we just need to buckle down and do it, that shouldn't be the characterization of our relationship with the Father. The overall characterization of our relationship with the Father should be one of thanksgiving and gratitude so that the joy leads us to do what he has called us to do because we know that he has good for us. When we obey the Lord and serve him because we're rejoicing, then our service becomes a delight and not a drudgery. It becomes a delight and not a drudgery when you start with thanksgiving. There's a Bible commentator, Matthew Henry, who wrote this. Holy joy will be the oil to the wheels of your obedience. Okay, oil is the lubricant involved in bearings and, and wheels so that they run smoothly and they're not grinding on each other all the time. That's what Matthew Henry kind of puts into this spiritual formula of following the, the word of God and following his call on our life going forward. That if we do it in joy, if we remind ourselves of thanksgiving and gratitude, it's like oil coming into that whole wheel process. And it's not grinding on each other. They're fluidly moving and it makes the journey so much better. To the believer without joy, the will of God, God and the call of God kind of feels like punishment without joy. But to the follower of God who is happy and experiences and disciplines themselves for joy in the Lord, the will of God is nourishment 
We see this most clearly in John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus says in John 4 these words. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. It's nourishment. It's nourishment to have the opportunity to do what God's given you to do. It's nourishment to be filled with the Holy Spirit and have the actual ability and power to do what God's called you to do. It's nourishment for your soul. If you go very many days without eating, guess what starts to happen? Your body breaks down. If you go an extended amount of time without eating, your body will eventually stop working. This is why the Lord uses the body, the physical body, to describe to us the reality of spiritual things so often. It's the same way with following the will of God. If you continue to do that in drudgery and just checking boxes going forward, eventually your spiritual life will feel lifeless. But if you do it in joy, then the life, the nourishment returns. That's what Jesus talked about in John chapter 4. To do the will of the Father is nourishment to his soul, Jesus says. To follow God in joy and in, in, in right appreciation of what God has done is actually like food. It keeps him healthy spiritually. So, what we see here going into Nehemiah 8, 13 through 18 is this. Rejoicing and celebrating is what brings life to the body of Christ. It brings life to what we do. What we find the people of God here is in the middle of the Jewish calendar in the seventh month. And in that seventh month, we touched briefly on the Day of Atonement last week. So we want to unpack that a little bit more because that's what leads us into this Feast of Booths. And that sounds like a very weird term, right? But this festival of what they call tabernacles, it's kind of the same word. Tabernacles, booths, they're these shelters that they would build out of branches, essentially. And they would live in them for seven days during the Feast of Booths. We'll talk a little bit more about why and what that signified for them in a moment. But in this seventh month of the Jewish calendar, the Day of Atonement was celebrated on the 10th day. So the 10th day of the seventh month was the Day of Atonement. And that's when every, all the people were supposed to come together towards Jerusalem and remember as the priests went and made reconciliation and atonement for the sins of the people. And as that happened, the people were supposed to be drawn in only to confession and repentance. And that part of the, the month, the calendar was a little more solemn. You were recognizing your sin and giving it to the Lord. As he forgives that sin, as the blood of those sacrifices both cover the sin and then the scapegoat is sent out into the wilderness carrying it away, after the 10th day of the month, month, which was the Day of Atonement, the 15th day of the month started the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. So you went from a solemn day where you remembered your own sin and were reminded of God's provision for it, and then you went into basically a seven-day party, okay? That wasn't just a random party. It was a party that God commanded and he laid out the, the guidelines for Celebrating God's goodness is a healthy spiritual endeavor. It's nourishment to our souls. The Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths went from the 15th day of the seventh month to the 21st, seven days. This gave the leaders a few days between the 10th and the 15th to do what? To get the word out. To get the word out, if you look at verse 16, actually just before that, in verse 15, it said they should proclaim this, they should publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go to the hills, bring branches of olive and wild olive and myrtle and palm and other leafy trees to build these booths, to make booths, as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves. So all of a sudden, remember the scene here. Ezra gets done, all the people are together. He's reading the word of God. It is amazing the people because they haven't read the word of God in a while very consistently. 
they start to get excited about the word of God. As they're getting excited about the word of God, the folks that are up front with Ezra and Nehemiah, they go down into the crowd and they explain it more and more so the people can understand more and more about the word of God. And as that happens, all of a sudden, some light bulbs start to go off. They say, wait, we just had the Day of Atonement. As we just read God's word to us. We're supposed to do this big feast in five days. So basically what Ezra then does, Ezra and Nehemiah send the leaders, they say, go tell everybody. Not an option. We as the people of God just celebrated God's word and we're moved by it. Now we're going to celebrate for seven days as we remember what he's done. The Feast of Booths particularly commanded them to live in these temporary, temporarily built shacks. Even if they had a house, they were to go up on the roof and build these shacks out of branches on their roofs and live up there, not in their homes, but live up there for that week. If they didn't have a home that had a roof, they couldn't access that. They were supposed to go out into the courtyards that they could get to and build a booth there. And their whole family was going to live in there for the week. If you didn't have access to that, you were to go to the public squares and the public courtyards and build a booth and live in that for the week. Sounds like a strange festival, right? We have houses, but let's build temporary houses and go live in those. But it has very specific meaning for the spiritual life of God's people to remember something that had happened previously. These seven days were to remind the people of God, of the 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness, not only of the exodus and God saving his people out of Egypt and out of the oppression and slavery that they were in, as God saves them out, he also had them in the wilderness. They were moving all the time. They were consistently setting up these tabernacle booths, these booths. They would take them down. They'd move to the next place as they followed the pillar of cloud and the, and the pillar of fire by night. And as they followed God, moving them through the wilderness, every time it stopped, people would set up camp. They'd build the tabernacle where the Levites would serve God. And then they would build their own little booths and they would live in them. So this festival of booths was a reminder for God's people. Remember how God took care of us, even when we didn't have our own stone and, and brick homes that they were living in in Jerusalem now. Remember back to when God miraculously saved them out of slavery, to when he miraculously provided for them as they were in the wilderness until they got to the promised land. So there's four distinct things that, that we kind of can pick up that God did through this festival, through this celebration. And these four things are critical for us to do today. I know, and we've said this before, sometimes you can read some Old Testament stories and think, wow, that was a neat story. It's cool how God's people did that. But what the Lord wants us to do is read these, these accounts of God's work and the accounts of God's people following his commands and ask ourselves the question, how do I do that? What does it look like for me to follow what God's called me to? How do I follow along with the, the healthy rhythms that God has implanted in his people all the way back to the day and age of Ezra and Nehemiah? So ask yourself that question as we go through these four things that this particular feast was meant to incorporate. First, this feast was a time for looking back and remembering another time that was difficult and life-changing. It was meant for to remember and look back to a different time that was two things. Pick these up. If you're writing notes, write this down. This time that they were supposed to remember while living in these shacks on the roof of their house or in the courtyards is to remind them that there was a previous time that was hard, was very difficult, and was also at the same time life-changing. Hard and life-changing. We have a tendency in our own lives to think that difficult things should be avoided. That's not how God works in the lives of his people. He uses difficult times to transform us, to change us, to be more like him. So this feast first was a reminder. Were those 40 years in the wilderness that God's people wandered, was that a difficult time? It was hard for God's people to do that. It was a difficult 40 years. 
It was also life-changing for those people that lived through it. So this first reminder was a reminder to look back and remember. 40 years in the wilderness, homeless, living in temporary shelters. At the same time, God providing for their every need. They didn't have a lot of extravagant stuff, but they had everything they needed. And God kept doing that for them. Secondly, this particular feast was meant to be a time for looking around at God's blessings. There's an interesting command here. They're supposed to go up on their roof and build this shack. Why? What do you see from your roof? You see out around everything. This seventh month of the Jewish calendar was also coinciding with the time of harvest. And the reminder for God's people was this. As you go up on your roof and you live there temporarily, when you come out of your booth, your shack that you've built out of branches, and you look out over the region, the harvest was coming in. Remember that God is the Lord of the harvest. That the harvest happens because God's hand is at work. So first, it was a reminder to look back. There was a difficult and changing, life-changing time for God's people. It was also an opportunity to look around. So we look back, we look around. How is God working? And what are we giving him credit for today? They were never to forget the giver as they enjoyed his gifts. That's a reminder from the Lord for them and for us. We enjoy God's gifts every day. For the most part, we are consistently provided for. Food, shelter, clothing, friendships, a church family, work, relationships with neighbors. God provides in so many ways. And how often, and this is as I was working my way through this particular point, how often do I, and, and maybe you're in this boat with me, I think I'm the only one, enjoy God's good gifts and fail to give credit to the giver. The people of God, God literally built into their calendar a reminder that what you have has come from the giver of good things. And we need to be reminded of that. We need set apart times in our lives where we just take a step back and we realize we've been blessed beyond anything we could deserve. And that doesn't come because of the work of our hands or our own self-fortitude or white-knuckling it at work and paying your bills. It comes because God is good and he is the giver of good things. So this feast was a time to look back and remember a difficult and life-changing time. This feast was also an opportunity to look around at God's blessings, to pause in the crazy busyness of life and just say, wow, look at this, would you? God is good. Thirdly, it was not only time to look back and look around, it was also a time to look ahead, to look ahead to the future kingdom that God promises his people. This was always part of God's plan, that his people would pause and not only look back at his provision, look at his current blessings, but then also look forward to what he has promised. And then the people in the wilderness are wandering for 40 years. And as they wandered, it was a consistent reminder that one day they will no longer wander. That God had promised what he called the promised land. And one day they would come into Canaan and God would give them that land. And it was a plentiful land. As it says, flowing with milk and honey, the, the two things that showed provision in that day and age. So as they wandered in the wilderness, they looked forward to God's promised land. As God's people got settled in the promised land, this was a reminder to continue to look forward for his kingdom towards the coming Messiah. So in Ezra and Nehemiah's age, they're doing this Feast of Booths. What are they looking forward to? They knew what they were looking back for. They knew what they were looking around for, God's blessings. What are they looking forward to? They're looking forward to the coming Messiah, Jesus. And they've been waiting 
for this. For generations, for thousands of years, God's people waiting for God to send the chosen one. They kept looking forward to this while they celebrated this Feast of Booths. So in the wilderness, they look forward to the promised land. While they're in the promised land, they look forward to the promised one. So where does that leave us now? The Messiah has come. The Lamb of God has taken away the sins of the world. What do we look forward to? We look forward to one day being out of the struggle of this world in the brokenness of sin and being in the presence of God because he has made a way through Jesus. Look forward to God's promise and write things into your life like constant reminders of the fact that one day we will be in a place where his promises are completely fulfilled. Just like he's always fulfilled his promises. While they're in the wilderness, they look to the promised land. God brought them into the promised land, provided for them. While they're in the promised land, they look forward to the promised one. Jesus, the Messiah, Christ comes. God provides for his people in that way. And now that we understand what Christ has done for us and we're living under this age of grace through the cross, we look forward to the day when one time we will not have to be under the weight of our brokenness anymore. And he will fully perfect us to bring glory to himself. Looking forward, heaven, it is what God has put on the horizon for those who follow him. It's what gives us hope and brings joy to our lives because sometimes you might stop and question, is that really coming? Feels like it's been a long time. When are we gonna get there? But you look forward in hope because you've looked back already and seen how God has continually provided for his people. You've looked around already and seen, while wow, his blessings are amazing right now. And in no way is his character going to change until he leads you to that. He has provided. He is providing. He will provide. This Feast of Booths, it was meant to be a spiritual discipline for God's people. A yearly recognition of these things. But fourthly, it's not just for those three. Looking back, looking around, and looking forward. It's also an opportunity to pause the everyday craziness of life and just enjoy the Lord. For these seven days, the people of God did not work. There was no labor going on. Remember in the previous section, if we read last, if you remember what we read last week, if there was anyone who didn't have enough food and provision during this week, those who had extra were supposed to go provide for them. Nobody was working. Everybody was enjoying God and his provision. So while it is a look back and a look around and a look forward, it also is a direct call to enjoy the Lord and as a result of that, experience his encouragement and his transformation. Because when we just stop and enjoy what God is doing, and we stop and pause the, the daily race that we're all involved in, it's interesting that it was seven days that they took. I remember when, I was, when our family was younger, we were in Philadelphia, we were planning churches, we were busy, we had young kids, we were doing lots of stuff, and we would go on vacation. And here's what I realized after a couple of years going on vacation is, we would, go, we would go for a week, but, but there was a travel day there, and then you're there for, for you know, four or five days, and then there's a travel day back because uh, we didn't live close to where we would go on vacation. And when you're traveling with four children under the age of eight or nine, all in the car at the same time, okay, we all know, all right? <laughs> so here's the reality. One thing I started to realize was, honestly, seven days wasn't even quite enough for us to get a time of rest because we'd get there, you wind down for a day or two. How I particularly work is once I'm two or three days from going back to everything, I start winding back up. 
So where was the rest in that? I'm winding down and then I'm winding back up and then we go back. See, the interesting thing that God did here is he knew that God's people need times of rest. It's in the rest where your head clears and your heart comes to the, front, the forefront. And you can really start to commune and acknowledge what God has done. It's in those times of rest. It's why he built in a Sabbath every week for us. Frankly, as Americans, we stink at that. We say, no, I have a day off on Saturday. What are you doing on your day off? Running around? Oh, okay, that's not really what he meant. It's literally times like this where the people of God were to stop. And then they could start to remember and start to enjoy and start to be encouraged and start to be changed. So when we read through these ideas of God's calendar that he put in place for his people and these routines, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Booths that followed, they're not just checklists on a calendar. These are intentional times where God wanted his people to remember and stop and pause and think and enjoy and be encouraged and then go back to all that he's called us to. This is a principle that we as a people of God should definitely put into practice in our lives. I'm not sure we should build booths and live in them for seven days, but what we should do is have dedicated times in our calendar year where we stop and we look back at how good God has been. We look around us at how good he currently is and we look forward to his great promises. And then we just take some time to enjoy it. You need this. Everybody needs this. God created us, and then he created these routines. Why? Because he knows us better than we know ourselves. So he is good and gracious as he moves forward with us. So as we look at what's going on in Nehemiah here, this isn't just a neat story for some people who forgot God's law and now built some walls, okay? This is an encouragement towards a spiritual discipline that changes your life, transforms you into something completely different in the Lord. The world's joy and the world's enjoyment that so many factors are impeding on our lives as Christians, that kind of joy is temporary and artificial. Whatever the world is telling you is going to bring you enjoyment in your life, it is short-lived and goes away, and then you got to find it again or find something better. When that joy is gone, people are left with greater weakness and greater emptiness than they were before they ran after it. Here's how that's different with the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord comes from God who has made you and cares for you. It is real and lasting and it doesn't come to an end. God doesn't give us joy instead of our sorrow. God doesn't give us joy in spite of our sorrow. He gives us joy in the midst of our brokenness and sorrow. That's the difference. Everything the world tells you is you got to get to a better place so that you can really enjoy things. You got to get to a better financial place. You got to get to a place of better recognition. You got to get to a better place relationally. You got to get somewhere else in order to enjoy that place. And here's what God says. No matter where you are, I will give you joy. No matter what circumstance you're in, I can bring joy to that circumstance. No matter what trial or mountaintop you're going through, the joy of the Lord remains consistently the same. You can find him in every season, and that kind of joy is transformational. I promise you, and this is a discipline every believer needs to continue to work on throughout their whole life, but I will promise you this from personal experience and from watching those before me. 
If you become disciplined in giving gratitude to the Lord and being joyful in every season, you will be changed. God works through that. He changes your outlook on the whole world. Your worldview becomes very different when you're consistently rejoicing. But you might be asking, Pastor Rob, I don't really like where I'm at right now. How am I going to do that? God's work in our lives is often painful as it transforms us. Just like those 40 years in the wilderness for God's people, it was changing God's people so that they were ready to enjoy what God had next for them. It's often painful as it transforms us, but it brings joy with it. Jesus illustrates this through a very specific and one that we will all somewhat understand, some of us more than others. Just a minute, I'll tell you the story. Jesus illustrates this through the miracle of birth. Okay, Now, we all experience the miracle of birth differently, right, ladies? Men, you experience the miracle of birth, but it's not quite like the ladies. But Jesus uses this miracle of birth because it's a common thing for us. It's something we all understand and can understand. And he compares that to our spiritual lives. Here's how he does that in John 16, verses 20 through 22. He says in those verses that there is pain involved in childbirth. And that pain results in the miraculous joy of a new life. And if you're a parent, you know that. I was just having a conversation with a young lady this morning who is newly pregnant. And as I'm having that conversation, I'm, she's talking about even the travails she's already in. And, and I'm thinking back to when Val was pregnant uh, four different times. And as I'm thinking through this, there was this thing I began using, a phrase I began using. It's called pregnancy amnesia. Because you go through this time and pregnancy is not always enjoyable, right? <laughs> For ladies. And then, and then childbirth, there, there's no enjoyment involved in childbirth, okay? And then there's this presence of this child that's a miracle. And the joy is overwhelming. And as a parent, you get to watch that child grow and the joy changes you. And all of a sudden... For, for our marriage, it was about 18 months later, Val say, I want to do that again. And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> do I need to show you the videos? I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't like all that great, remember? <laughs> um, but the joy of the result is worth the pain of the experience. And Jesus uses that as a spiritual example for us. As you're going through difficult times, God is at work. And what is the result? The result of him working in your life is the kind of joy that you could never have if you didn't go through it. And the joy that comes with parenting children can't happen without the experience of going through birth first. <laughs> This is how God wants to work in our spiritual lives, just like he's working in the people of God in Ezra and Nehemiah's day. He wants us to remember back. Remember those 40 years. It was hard, but the result was God's blessing. And just remember that in our own lives. When you're going through something, life is difficult. And anybody gets up and tells you it's all roses is lying to you. But God is overwhelmingly good in all of it. That's the truth that gets you through things. This kind of joy only comes when we recognize that difficult circumstances are pregnant with joy and faith that God wants to bring to you after. That's why God uses that example in John 16 when Jesus is talking about the pain of childbirth and the resulting joy that comes because he wants us to understand that hard times are pregnant with joy and faith. And you have to go through it to get there. So trust him. Did the blessings of this celebration, the Feast of Booths, did those blessings last? Were people always celebrating? No, they were not. 
we are people just like these were people and they forgot. They forgot. The everyday mundaneness of life took over and eventually they had to be reminded by what God supernaturally put into their yearly calendar to stop and celebrate again. Stop and look at God. Be reminded of who he is and what he's done. Celebrations last for a time because we are broken, fallible people, but the people become careless again and the leaders had to bring them back to the word of God and remind them of all that God had called them to. From time to time in the history of the church, God's spirit has burdened people to pray and search the scriptures and confess sins both individually and corporately together. And from these sincere spiritual moments and exercises, God then brings fresh life to his people. And we can watch this as we look back through God's, the history of God's people. It happened in Nehemiah's day. And what I'm here to remind us of today is it can happen today. If we do what God has laid out for us to do to pause, to confess our sins, genuinely. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. That is a truth that we need to live by. The confessing sins of the people, like in Ezra and Nehemiah's day, will bring people to a remembrance of God's great forgiveness and grace, which leads us forward in joy, rejoicing for what he's done. 2 Chronicles 7, 14 says, if my people who are called by my, my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That promise was true in Ezra and Nehemiah's day. That promise is true today for us. If we turn to him and confess our sins and seek him with all that we have, he will heal us and heal us together, and he will begin to heal others as well. It's this kind of encouragement, like the people of God being recorded for us in Nehemiah 8, and how they responded to God's word, that brings us to a decision point as God's people. What will you do today? What will you do? Will you choose to confess your sin and turn from your evil ways? and turn towards God and seek him with everything you have? Revival was in the midst of Ezra and Nehemiah's day, right here in chapter eight, because God's people did that. God wants to do that again amongst his people, and he wants to do it again amongst his people in the future, and he wants to continually have God's people come back to the same realization that he is a good God who has done far more than we could ask or think. And as we even, as the people of God, had a moment where we got to stop and celebrate a goal that, frankly, I know I talked with some of you, uh, even as we talked about trying to do some, the next things that God might be calling us to and serve others and remind us of his work amongst us in this big 175th fund goal that we had. I, I know most of you probably thought, eh, we're not, probably not gonna make that. And look at what God does. He doesn't do it so we can stare at numbers on a page. He does it so we can be amazed and trust him more going forward. That's why he does it. So let's do that together as God's people. Let's rejoice in who he is. And every week when we come back together here and we gather, let that be the reminder. As you look forward to what God's gonna do and you look around at God's great blessing of his people and all that he has brought into our lives. And let's believe him even more every Sunday afternoon when we walk out of here. Because like God's people on that day, we're reminded once again of how great he is. Let's pray.